Good day. My name is Wilbert van Rooij. I'm the manager of SaVision. This pitch is made in collaboration with Dirk Hoekman, who works both at SaVision and at the Wageningen University. SaVision is a private remote sensing company founded by the researchers of Wageningen University. My pitch today is about SAR Sentry, a unique deforestation and forest degradation monitoring system that SaVision developed in collaboration with the Wageningen University. SaVision is a frontrunner in automated monitoring systems for large-scale natural resource management. We integrate data from multiple satellite constellations with other sensors using cutting-edge algorithms and the environmental economic accounting models. SaVision distinguishes itself from other remote sensing companies by its large expertise in advanced radar technology. Radar images are used by many, but our state-of-the-art algorithms are unparalleled. They are the core of a monitoring system and guarantee a sustained generation of high quality information with high accuracy. One of SARVision's monitoring systems is the SAR Sentry Near Real Time Forest Monitoring System. This is an operational system that is implemented in several tropical countries. It differs from other large scale monitoring systems by its higher accuracy and capability to detect forest degradation that cannot even be observed by high-resolution optical systems, nor by other existing radar monitoring systems. So Sentry is cost-efficient, as it uses free-of-cost Sentinel-1 radar data. Even small-scale selective logging is detected accurately. The system is fully automated and can easily be implemented by governments and other clients on their own hardware or in the cloud. Unlike most other systems, it is transferred to clients which makes them owner of the data. Governments can run the system by themselves and the products can be used as a legal basis for intervention decisions. So Sentry can also be used to monitor carbon losses in near real time when appropriate baseline maps are available. Here you see a visualization of the near real time degradation detection of the SAR Sentry monitoring system in Suriname, west of the Brokopondo Lake over the period 2017 to February 2021. You can see the development of forest roads in yellow, and the lighter colors indicate different intensities of forest degradation caused by selective logging. The gray area indicates non-forest or forest clearing before 2017. This image shows the forest degradation in late December 2020. In the two encircled areas, there is a clear difference of logging intensity. In area A, the selective logging seems systematic, while in area B, logging seems more chaotic with a high level of degradation. The area of forest degradation is much larger than the yellow deforested area. But expressed as total forest loss, the forest degradation in this area is almost as large as the area of deforestation. When we make a comparison with GLAD, we can see that it detects most of the logging roads with hardly any forest degradation. The optical-based GLAD system uses bare soil fraction as proxy to map forest change. SAR Sentry uses physical measurement of canopy volume change as proxy for forest loss and forest regrowth. As forest degradation is an important indicator of current and future forest loss, it is essential for early warning systems. Currently, WWF Netherlands is using data from SAR Vision for its early warning system in Borneo and the Guianas. Here you see another animation of forest degradation in Suriname, in an area with a lot of selective logging. You can see well how the construction of roads is followed by degradation. The Foundation for Forest Management and Production Control in Suriname, SBB, are very excited about the system. They are currently validating the results. In this area, the total forest loss due to degradation is almost half of that caused by deforestation. The deforestation detection is in line with that of GLAD, but the temporal resolution is higher as the SAR Sentry system is not affected by clouds. You can see that the forest degradation is almost absent in GLAD. Here you see an example of SAR Sentry results in Kalimantan, in an area that is converted for plantations. So Sentry indicates slightly more deforestation in 2020 than GLAD, 
but this could be the result of a no data period in GLAD due to the frequent cloud cover in these moist forests. Note that there are also differences in the used baseline. GLAD uses a global forest non-forest map, while the SARS entry system uses its own baseline. And here is another comparison of the two systems in Kalimantan, in an area with a lot of selective logging. Forest degradation is widespread and causes almost as much forest loss as caused by deforestation. As mentioned earlier, Southcentry can also be used for accurate biomass and carbon mapping. For this product, Southvision developed the SAR biomass system. It combines multi-sensor baseline maps with Southcentry's forest change maps to assess near real-time biomass and carbon changes in forest areas. This new approach includes the significant contribution of forest degradation as part of the biomass volume. The SAR biomass system not only improves the accuracy of existing satellite-based methods, it also allows to monitor carbon changes over time. Um, you can say that the SAR Sentry system detects deforestation slightly better than GLAD, with a far more stable temporal resolution. But regarding forest degradation, the SAR Sentry system is really unique. It outperforms optical forest monitoring systems, such as GLAD, and also other radar-based forest monitoring systems. The SAR Sentry system can also be used to assess forest regrowth. SAR Sentry opens up the possibility for various new research topics. And here are just two mentioned. For instance, study of interferometric and polarimetric properties of forest change, and the elaboration of differences of L-band for forest monitoring. Thank you for listening. Buenos días, yo soy Daniel Castillo, el jefe del área de monitoreo de bosques en el Programa Nacional de Conservación de Bosques del Ministerio del Ambiente del Perú. Eh, esta oportunidad vengo a traerles un poco, eh, darles a conocer lo que es nuestra plataforma Geobosques, específicamente de una de las líneas de información que tenemos, que es las alertas tempranas de deforestación. La plataforma Geobosques es una plataforma de libre acceso para cualquier usuario donde pueda acceder a toda la información disponible eh, del país. De, sobre el tema de monitoreo de cobertura de bosques. Para nosotros la plataforma eh, y las líneas de trabajo son varias. ¿no? Ustedes pueden entrar a la plataforma, al, entran al buscador, ponen geobosques y acceden a la plataforma fácilmente. Las líneas de trabajo son principalmente eh, deforestación, es decir, datos anuales oficiales de deforestación se ponen a disposición a través de esta plataforma para cualquier usuario. Datos de degradación, aunque actualmente venimos en proceso de desarrollo de de implementar este submódulo de información, pero es obviamente lo, lo que eh, el bosque que ha sido perturbado, intervenido, pero que no llegó a convertirse, a perderse en realidad, ¿no? que no llegó a haber deforestación. El uso y cambio de uso, es decir, lo que se deforestó, a qué se convirtió, pero en grandes, en grandes clases, ¿no? No, a detalle, no identificando cultivo por cultivo. ¿no? Alertas tempranas de deforestación, que es lo que hoy nos, nos trae un poco de lo que le voy a ver un poco más, que son la información recurrente, ¿no? Cada eh, 16, 21 días mostramos, eh, actualizamos información sobre estas tempranas de deforestación eh, en el ámbito del bosque amazónico del país. ¿no? Y justamente, eh, como les decía, ustedes pueden entrar a la plataforma eh, de forma um, gratuita, entran al buscador, la, la encuentran y eh, acá van a poder identificar estos, estas líneas de trabajo que les acabo de mencionar hace un momento. Si vamos a las alertas tempranas de deforestación, eh, verán, eh, al ingresar a ese submódulo, ¿no? que lo que primero que les va a solicitar es eh, suscribirse, porque la idea es que eh, bajo un correo electrónico y un usuario específico puedan acceder a esta información de forma personalizada, porque lo que te permite la plataforma no es solo recibir la información eh, de todas las áreas, de todo el ámbito amazónico, ¿no? sino también información puntual de áreas específicas que son de tu interés. Puedes hacer seguimiento de espacios específicos en, en el territorio eh, peruano con ámbito de bosque para conocer cuál es la dinámica y cómo se va moviendo la deforestación en ese espacio. Si eres una autoridad, eh, una entidad a cargo de un espacio, puedes hacerle seguimiento desde esa plataforma. ¿No? La información de la temprana te permite eh, tener datos, como les digo, cada 16, 21 días, a partir de lanzas 7 y 8, ¿no? que es el insumo principal. 
Y, y la característica te permite identificar desde caminos, nuevos caminos forestales que se van a abrir en el bosque, a ver pequeña agricultura, etcétera, eh, la identificación de algunas actividades ilícitas. Entonces, eh, es importante poder tener acceso y uso libre a este tipo de, de datos, ¿no? Como segundo paso, lo que haces es definir ya cuáles son esas áreas de interés a las cuales quieres hacer seguimiento. Puedes definirlo por límites políticos, es decir, departamentos, provincias o distritos, que son las categorías políticas en el país. O también puedes hacerlo por eh, lo que nosotros le decimos categorías territoriales. ¿no? Es decir, según el derecho asignado en el bosque, puede ser una área protegida, que sea de tu interés, puede ser una concesión forestal, puede ser una comunidad, ¿no? un espacio donde hay bosque específica a la que tú quieres hacer seguimiento porque trabajas ahí, porque es tu área de interés. Entonces, simplemente te suscribes bajo ese espacio, puedes eh, buscarlo, encontrarlo. O si tienes un área más personalizada, que tú tienes un archivo Shapefile, por ejemplo, lo puedes cargar a la plataforma e eh, incluirlo como un área de interés personal tuya. ¿no? Es así como puedes eh, llegar a, 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 a este detalle. Ya cuando entras al visor, vas a tener sobre el lado izquierdo todas las áreas sobre las cuales tú te has suscrito y haces seguimiento y ya puedes mirar sobre la información de cada una específicamente en, en, en cualquier área de interés que, que te hayas suscrito, ¿no? O también cualquier otro espacio, ¿no? Sin necesidad de que te hayas suscrito también, pero a veces tenemos áreas específicas que queremos hacer seguimiento. Tiene los datos anuales de deforestación, tenemos el, un, información de raster de, a partir de Sentinel-2, que, servicios que, que hemos podido incluir en la plataforma que te permitan hacer una verificación okay, de justamente estos eventos de deforestación que te vamos reportando porque la condición de la pandemia ha sido muy complicada y, y hemos tenido que hacer incluso mejoras en, en la plataforma para, para mejorar el servicio, no es el objetivo, ¿no? que nuestros usuarios se vean eh, contentos con el servicio que brindamos y, y que tengan la garantía de que la información que le estamos brindando es información de calidad. ¿no? Después eh, van a poder también tener información complementaria ¿no? De, de estos espacios donde estás haciendo seguimiento, vas a poder encontrar, por ejemplo, mapas de, de concentración eh, del foco de calor, de, donde, de, donde tú identificas justamente dónde se concentra esta deforestación. Acá tenemos algunos ejemplos, eh, puedes hacer seguimiento de esos, esos focos, también esas áreas, y también puedes tener información eh, eh, anexa respecto a saber cuál es la categoría del territorio que está ahí, ¿no? o sea, quién es el responsable de ese espacio para poder tomar las acciones conjuntas con, con estos actores, ¿no? Esto puede ser diverso, ¿no? Dependiendo de dónde se esté moviendo la deforestación, tenemos diversos actores, acá hay concesiones, acá hay comunidades. Entonces, es importante que el trabajo sea articulado para, para controlar el problema entre todos estos actores en el territorio, ¿no? Entonces, eh, a, ahí podemos ver también, también ese tipo de información. Y que, como, como les digo, puede llegar directamente a tu correo electrónico si te suscribes y haces seguimiento a un área puntual. Algo que hacemos también mucho es... Eh, eh, hacer capacitaciones. Eh, ahí a la derecha pueden ver el formato, cómo les va a llegar las alertas con los datos de cada una de las áreas que se han suscrito y cuál es la superficie de bosque que se está identificando como deforestación a través de las alertas en estas áreas. Y luego puedes entrar a verla cada una como ya les he mostrado. No, pero las capacitaciones que hacemos también eh, han servido de mucho para que los usuarios sepan cómo utilizar la información. Antes hemos hecho capacitaciones mucho más presenciales, identificando las alertas propiamente en campo, también las últimas alertas, lo cual nos ayuda mucho a, a verificar, a darle confianza al usuario sobre la calidad de la información. Y también tenemos manuales que hemos ido eh, generando para, para eh, el análisis y uso de esta data. ¿no? Actualmente venimos desarrollando una plataforma para, para dar estas capacitaciones virtuales de forma más, más dinámica, porque las condiciones también de pandemia no nos permiten mucho hacer este tipo de capacitaciones presenciales. ¿no? Estamos tratando de mejorar también a través de generar reportes eh, específicos para usuarios. O sea, nosotros va a ser muy complicado poder atender a todos los usuarios que tenemos, tenemos casi 4.000, pero sí podemos hacer que eh, generar un servicio que al usuario le permita hacer un reporte, un reporte semiautomático de su área de interés y, y, y poder ir a campo y podemos poner esto también como una herramienta que estamos implementando a futuro para el usuario. ¿No? Eh, tenemos usuarios diversos desde todo nivel de internacionales, nacionales y regionales y, y locales también que utilizan la información dependiendo de sus competencias, del trabajo que realizan o, 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 que, o que desempeñan ¿no? desde, la, desde los órganos de control, el Servicio Nacional de Naturales Protegidas, las organizaciones indígenas, eh, las fiscalías ambientales. Es muy, muy diverso el, el, los usuarios que tenemos. Y esto es un poquito los siguientes pasos que, que, que siempre estamos pensando en cómo mejorar. Eh, no solo eh, brindar el dato, sino cómo lo podemos poner a mejor disposición del usuario. ¿no? Eso es importante. No solo es tener la data eh, libre a disposición, sino 
cómo facilitamos para que el usuario pueda sacarle un mejor provecho, ¿no? Como les mencioné, herramientas para generar reportes automáticos, servicios de interoperabilidad, también con algunas otras plataformas de información de otras entidades, ayuda mucho, ¿no? Y, y servicios de capacitación web que venimos trabajando, ¿no? Y acá les dejo, eh, para finalizar, un, un par de links de unos videos de, de la plataforma y de las alertas tempranas que les va a ser de mucha utilidad si quieren conocer un poquito más sobre ellas. Muchas gracias. Hello guys, so today I will talk about Map Humans Alert, um, a process that we are developing in Brazil. But before I start with that, just like talk a little bit about Map Humans as an initiative. It's, a, it's an initiative that started in 2015, involving uh, 20 organizations in Brazil between uh, NGOs, startups in technology and uh, universities uh, that are dedicated to understand the land use change that are happening in Brazil. So everything about land use change, all the transitions that happens on the use of the land. Uh, so the main product that we are producing is the land use land cover uh, mapping of Brazil on 30 meter resolution that goes back to 85 all the way to 2019. We are just preparing for 2020 also. It includes 21 classes that we are mapping, uh, ranging from forests, um, you know, farming, uh, urban areas and so on and with about 90% uh, uh, global accuracy. So you, you can travel in space in time on those maps, um, like, like here, for example, we see in the Xingu area on 85 and then see them in 2018. Um, and then you, you can also um, uh, see the land use change on, on any area of, of the country by state, by municipality, and so on. So, um, uh, apart from this project, we have uh, several other initiatives linked to Map Biomas, including uh, Map Biomas Water, which are mapping uh, monthly the water surface in Brazil and classifying by natural and artificial uh, water bodies. Then there is Map Biomas Fire, which is mapping the fire scars um, in all the countries since '85, also in a monthly basis. Uh, GeoCovid, we're dealing with um, the projections uh, related uh, to the COVID spread, but using geographic uh, information. And then there is Map Biomas Network, which is the reproduction of the Map Biomas Initiative in other regions like all the countries in the Amazon, the Chaco region, uh, Indonesia, uh, and so forth. So today I will, I will concentrate on Map Biomas Alert, which is um, dedicated to um, help to understand the process that are happening on, on uh, deforestation and how to act upon upon that. So uh, it starts in 2018 when we were having a discussion about like all the different alert systems that are operating in Brazil. So there, there is 11 of them um, with different resolution, cloud coverage, frequency, some of them dealing with deforestation, degradation, and they are acting also in different parts of the country, like in the Amazon, Kachinga, Cerrado, and so on. So uh, there was a demand um, from the users to have a, uh, you know, a, a better um, integration of all those systems so it, it, it will be easier for them to, to use. So we put together this group of uh, organizations, both uh, the alert providers and users of alerts together in 2018 to discuss how we can make something that would be more agile and, and efficient to combat illegal, especially illegal deforestation uh, based on the alerts that were already existent. So um, we decided with this group that we should focus in Map Biomas not to create new alert systems, but actually to combine all those alerts and try to, to take, take it out from them um, better action-oriented reporting. So what we are doing is aggregating the alerts in all the biomes, and then we validate and refine those uh, alerts with high-resolution imagery, prepare customized reports, or allow people to prepare customized reports, and publish everything on a customized platform, um, you know, a unified platform, which will have APIs and so on. So this, this is what we are concentrating ourselves. So in a nutshell, what we are, we are doing is, is moving from this situation where, uh, you know, the agents receive a alert like this one, and they have to prepare a report, and this report should contain, you know, information on authorization, if it's crossing protected areas or not, exactly when it happens, um, to have, you know, proper information if the location, in time and space. 
And so to produce those reports for each one of those alerts, normally the environmental agencies would take about six hours. So the result of this is that in 2018, uh, from the 150,000 alerts that all those systems produced, less than 1% were turned into reports that were actually actionable. So we have a lot of reports, but we're not using the reports properly. So we are concentrating ourselves in solving this problem. So the first thing we do is basically to find out whether we're exactly on the space in time that these alerts is happening by uh, utilizing planet imagery and tree meter resolution. And then we, we find out an image before and after the deforestation occur so we can validate and we can also locate in space and time. So, um, so we take all the different alerts, uh, the main ones that are operating in Brazil, covering all the biomes. And so all those alerts get into the, the platform and um, in each one of those alerts, we will find out an image before and after, validate. For example, we will eliminate uh, alerts that represents like harvesting of, uh, of forest plantations, for example. And then so, so we clean up this, find out the image before and after, and then we redesign the alerts and refine the polygon. So you have at the end, you know, a, a, a polygon that represents exactly where in the space is the, the, the alert, and then you have the image before and after, so you know exactly on time where this deforestation happens. Um, then we cross all this information with the authorizations, the uh, you know protected areas, maps, the private properties, and then we can we can produce a report in which uh, we locate this alert and say if the, there is evidence of illegality and stuff like that. So the the final report will be like the report that will be equivalent for the that the one that the for example the government agencies needs to act. So this goes to a platform. So there's a website, and then you can get into the in this website you can get to each one of the alerts that are prepared. You see, you have the image before and after uh, to play, and then you have all the reports related to that alert. So for example, if it's crossing more than one property, you will find different, uh, you know, a report for each one of the properties that are uh, linked to this alert. Uh, and then you have the report uh, on each one of them. Uh, and this is, you know, presented on different formats for the different users. For example, you can have a PDF file of the report, you can have the shape file of the alerts, the database, there is APIs and web services to access directly. Uh, and there is even a plugin on, on, on QGs for to pushing out uh, the data. So uh, we are also producing an annual report which, which uh, makes sense of what we learn when you when you get the aggregation of all those reports, which was just published, the 2020 report was just published last week, um, and, and, and we we'll have like all the analysis of uh, everything that we find out uh, during that year. So let me just just some quick lessons of what we learned from uh, from January uh, 2019 when we start until May um, uh, last month. So we have evaluated 300. 30,000 alerts uh, one by one in the platform and we have validated, refined and published 140,000 um, alerts and 2.9 million actors that are represented on those alerts. Uh, and from those alerts we, we have produced 250,000 reports uh, on deforestation. This is like, just to have an idea, this is like 100 times more than what was prepared in, in the, by all federal agencies um, government agencies in 2018. And we are publishing now about 1,000 to 1,500 um, alerts per week. Um, so the users of the platform today, there are 1,000 uh, one registered users. Um, they, they are, I mean, it's free for everyone to look at the data, but uh, if you register, then you can kind of uh, customize things. Uh, there is 153 institutions that they are registered in the platform, including financial institutions, federal and state agencies, business NGOs, and 62 customized report. Means like those institutions have created their own reports inside of uh, the platform that is used by the different uh, workers there. Uh, some major results about like when you look at the whole uh, all the alerts. It's uh, the first one is that about 98% of the deforestation detected between you know 2019 and 2000. Uh, 20 have at least one evidence of illegality. Over 70% of the deforestation crossed with areas with private domain, including like environmental rural regist registry, the car system. 
and thus responsibility could be assigned because you know where they are. Um, nevertheless, uh, less than 2% of the deforestation events and 5% of the area have uh, have been sued, fined or received embargo from Ibama and other federal agencies. So there is a long way to go. And, and finally, as kind of a main conclusion of the 30 months of operation of the system, um, it's clear that there is not uh, there, there is enough alerts, technology, and reports on deforestation today uh, with the platform. Um, the challenge now is to guarantee that we have the political will to turn those reports uh, into action. And, and so the strategy now that we're putting a lot of energy is to push and support the government agencies and private sector to act. So in the government side, law enforcement, regulation of markets and financial systems, and, and in the business side to restrict finance and market for the products coming from deforestation and, and also make traceability as a requirement. Uh, so all the information is available on, on alertusmapiomas.org and, um, and looking forward for the, the questions and debate that will come. Hi, my name is Karen Tabor and I'm the Senior Director of Ecological Monitoring at Conservation International. Today I'm going to talk about our early warning alert system, Firecast, and how we're improving the tool to be a more inclusive conservation technology. Conservation International started developing monitoring and alert systems in the early 2000s. We recognized that fire was the main tool for deforestation, especially illegal deforestation, and we also knew that there was amazing monitoring data from satellites that showed where fires are um, detected. And we started trying to make that connection between the satellite data and the decision maker on the ground. How do we make that information useful? So Firecast is not a global system. We work in countries where Conservation International has offices because we have people in country who are providing locally relevant data sets and directly engaging users to inform the design of the tool. When we started designing fire alert systems about 20 years ago, we did start with a co-design process of um, talking with users, engaging users, engaging stakeholders, uh, designing the product, the end product based on their needs. But that was really only scratching the surface on a where we're trying to go, which is um, towards inclusive conservation technologies. So yes, it's co-designed of technologies, but it also addresses some uh, tricky issues related to data privacy, um, also uh, asking questions about introducing a technology, um, what are the consequences, can it do harm? Um, we also make sure that we do a thorough assessment of needs before doing capacity building. This is a picture of a needs assessment workshop with indigenous communities in Peru, where we just started with the question, what are your land management goals? what are your challenges and then we're talking with them about what tools that are currently available that they could use or maybe there isn't a tool out there that they can use and so there that's an opportunity for development um, but there's still a very long way to go in terms of ensuring diversity in the development and also operation of conservation technologies we're trying multiple approaches to advance Firecast as an inclusive conservation technology. First, we want to provide more timely monitoring information. We learned from the Amazon fires in 2019 that we needed a forest disturbance alert in addition to our fire alert because many of the fires had occurred on land that was deforested months prior to the fire season. We also want to improve the accessibility and discoverability of forest disturbance alert products and deliver information directly to users through email and through SMS. 
and we want to increase the usability of these alerts. We're hoping by providing a single source for multiple alert products, it's easier for users to access the data, and also we filter it by their area of interest so they don't have to go to multiple sites and download information and then subset it to their area of interest. We want to integrate multiple forest disturbance alert products into a single product to leverage the strengths of all the products and the multiple sensors um, that make up those products. And we also want to improve the interpretability of the alerts by providing information in the language of the user's choice and communicating it in a way that it's uh, easy to interpret and to make a decision. And then based on the our needs assessments that we were doing in the region, we know that we need to do more capacity building, but not just teach about this tool. Um, capacity building starts with also making sure that the users understand the fundamentals of GPS and GIS. And this picture here is one of our GIS experts um, teaching community members about GPS because they need to understand the, the, fa the fundamentals of the information, the geographic information, so then they can better understand the satellite-based products and then they can also better understand the limitations of the products. So what we are doing is we're combining the RAD, GLAD, GLADS2, and JJFAST force disturbance products into a single alert at 30 meter resolution. Our system cannot handle the 10 meter resolution data, so it is a, definitely a computing capacity limit um, for us. Um, we're combining the information based on confidence and, and hoping that mul if multiple systems detect a disturbance in an area, then that increases the confidence that that is a real forest disturbance. And by September, we're working, we're going to be disseminating these alerts to SMS um, and email to a group of test users in the Amazon region. We've identified a couple challenges in this current project. One, as I mentioned, the size of the data is massive and we've really hit our limit on cloud computing. Um, second is trying to figure out how to communicate force disturbance to a user through WhatsApp. Right now we're clustering the data and providing a centroid of that cluster to a user in text. But I know if I receive a lat long coordinate in my neighborhood, I wouldn't know what direction that was or how far away that is from me. So we need to figure out a better way. And one way perhaps is by sending an image, a JPEG um, of that area where the disturbance is, um, but we're still working that out. We're also struggling with how can we support long-term capacity building to use this tool because capacity building is absolutely essential to the use of data in these the systems. And of course, um, the long-term vision is how are we going to increase the diversity in those who are designing and operating of technologies like Firecast. Thank you so much for the opportunity to talk today. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Ovidio Cilic, and on behalf of all the authors, I will be presenting our analysis on near real-time tropical forest above ground carbon loss. Our analysis focuses on Africa's primary humid tropical forest for the years 2019 and 2020. We used as input two major data sources, the near real-time ARAD forest disturbances alerts at 10 meter spatial resolution derived from Sentinel-1 radar data, and starting with 2019, and a map of above-ground carbon estimates for 2018 at a spatial resolution of 100 meter. We overlaid the two datasets to obtain local forest carbon loss at two scales, 10 meter and 100 meter, together with the associated uncertainties. In the analysis, we separated between core and edge forest disturbance alerts, as well as between high and low confidence alerts. We considered the alerts bigger than 0.2 hectares. We analyzed 24 countries, and the top five countries shown here are responsible for 83% of the total carbon loss for the two years analyzed. These countries also contain 88% of the primary humid tropical forests in Africa. 
Rather than stating absolute numbers of carbon loss, we are more interested in the monthly temporal patterns of these losses shown here at the monthly level for 2019 and 2020. This reveals various monthly patterns of forest carbon losses for countries strongly related to the rainfall patterns. Countries like Cameroon and Madagascar show a clear dry wet season variation per year with high amplitudes, while the Republic of Congo and the Democratic Republic of the Congo, due to their latitudinal extent, have regional differences between the dry and wet seasons. Here we have an example of carbon loss through time in the Central African Republic. While selective logging on the left happens throughout the year with varying intensity, the smallholder agriculture on the right shows a strong seasonality with three months in a year with high forest carbon losses resulted from converting the forested areas to agriculture. We developed high special and temporal resolution forest carbon loss estimates for the primary humid tropical forest of Africa. The findings have implications for national reporting of carbon losses with near real-time updates and the possibility of predictions way before a year ends. This is a 100% radar-based approach with both the alerts and the biomass map relying on such data. As such, the C-band radar of the alerts has a high sensitivity to moisture variation and might cause false alerts in swamp forests. The L-band used for the biomass map tends to saturate and underestimate high biomass values. The next steps will include expanding the analysis for other tropical forest areas. Some of the research challenges we faced might include the need for more accurate and updated biomass estimates with better estimating the high biomass values. We separated the RAD alerts into core and edge pixels, with edge disturbances quantified as 50% loss of the initial carbon stock. This introduces subjectivity but accounts for the fact that boundary pixels often represent partial tree cover removal. We provided associated uncertainties both at the pixel and country level by combining the propagated uncertainties of the biomass map with the commission and omission errors from the RAD alerts. How best to integrate the error is still an ongoing process. We only consider the alerts larger than 0.2 hectares. Therefore, the small scale disturbances that were not considered would add to the total carbon loss estimate although would probably increase the commission errors. Thank you for your attention. Good day, everyone. My name is Jorn Dallinga, working at WWF Netherlands. And today I will pitch the early warning system to predict and prevent deforestation. Let me kick off with a small movie. There are a variety of existing forest monitoring systems using satellite data. Most of them have a focus on detecting deforestation after this has happened. But then the damage has already been done. As prevention is better than a cure, we are developing a system that predicts illegal deforestation and provides an action protocol for land managers. An early warning system for early detection and predicting illegal deforestation through machine learning and big data. If we can detect early indicators of deforestation, such as road and canal development, we can predict areas that are in a high risk of illegal deforestation. This enables us to take action before the damage has been done or in the early stages of ongoing illegal deforestation. If we know where to expect illegal deforestation, then all stakeholders receive an alert with options. This alert has to be designed for taking immediate action. Then we have enough evidence to start interventions to prevent illegal deforestation. So how does the technology work? At step one to the left of your screen, we combine and collect a lot of historical uh, satellite data, deforestation data based on Sentinel-1 radar that can also penetrate clouds. So you'll have a near real-time monitoring system. Uh, 
We combine that data with other forms of open and publicly available data. So think of elevation and population density maps at step two. In step three, we combine all those data sets and use that in a predictive model. And step four, the output of that model uh, is showing forests that are at risk of deforestation over the course of six months. The model predicts deforestation at a resolution of 15 by 15 meter. That's basically a big tree. However, it's very challenging to predict deforestation with such a high resolution. So we downsample uh, or aggregate the predictions to a resolution of 480 by 480 meters uh, and refer to those as hot zones using max pooling. In short, the results of the model, so we predict six months into the future and we have achieved a user accuracy of 80% for those six months with a detection rate or recall of 50%. We've tested a variety of machine learning models, and the best performer is an ensemble trees model called XGBoost. Now, how does, does the output look like for a stakeholder looking at the dashboard? They will see the deforestation and forest degradation that happened over a long period of time. Overlaying the predictions or hot zones on top of that, these are the locations that will experience deforestation within six months. Now, let's plot the deforestation that actually happened six months later on top of this map. In yellow, you will see the deforestation that actually happened. You can specifically see the top right, a large cluster of deforestation that came true six months later. EWS is being tested in several countries at the same time through pilots, Indonesia, Gabon and Suriname. The pilots are still ongoing and are a few months in, but we already get some promising results through the stories from the stakeholders themselves. For Indonesia, for example, the predictive information helps a lot to reroute patrols. In Gabon, they're still testing the validity of the model by going to historic predictions and see if they came true. In Suriname, they specifically mentioned that a lot of the predictions that they visited did not show any signs yet of upcoming deforestation. So they are very curious to see if those predictions come true in the end. So there's a lot of room for discussion and, and research needs here to list a few. So for example, what are the main sensitivities in the models? Uh, but also how to better incorporate seasonality of deforestation and related activities. Um, what is, for example, needed to adapt the model to predict land conversion in different vegetation types in different countries. Short term versus medium term forecasting of deforestation, um, but also explore additional data inputs and their predictive power. Think of other forms of social and economic data, such as gold prices or even telco data. Another challenge in a research need is the unclarity of legality of deforestation that is not always fixed in time, such as national parks, but for example, the overharvesting of uh, trees in concessions that at some point it does become illegal, but in general it is not. So these are interesting to discuss during this forum. One of the other challenges and research needs is to measure impact of a predictive deforestation system. Uh, so far now we are deploying a Baki framework, so the before after control impact. Uh, one of the solutions we found is to statistically match sample points on control variables listed here below uh, between pilot and uh, control sites. We do, however, are challenged with the fact that how realistic is it to expect this impact of reduced or even uh, prevented deforestation within the time frame of six months, when, for example, not everyone is doing true interventions yet, but are more in the investigation phase of, of understanding the system and trying to brainstorm what one could do to prevent deforestation at those sites. Thank you everyone for listening. I'm really curious to the next steps in terms of discussion, how we, for example, could tackle the research needs. Thank you.